who was Christopher Columbus on uh, the 12th of October, 1492? Columbus and his three ships, um, the Nina, the Pinta, the Santa Maria, discovered land in the Americas. They arrived around the area of the Bahamas. Columbus fell down on his feet, gave thanks to God. He named the island that he landed on San Salvador, Holy Savior. This man, Christopher Columbus, uh, changed the world. He was part of a larger crew of great explorers and discoverers. Uh, after him came Vespucci, uh, John Cabot, Magellan, others. But Columbus was the first, and you do get a lot of points for being, for being first. Uh, his was, he was born uh, Cristoforo Colombo. It's kind of funny when Columbus moves from one country to another how his name kind of changes. He was the son and grandson of woolen weavers. Uh, he was a proud Genoan. In that time, uh, Italy wasn't a single country, and so Genoa was a kingdom, and he was a Genoese sailor, very proud of, uh, of that. Um, he learned his craft in Portugal. The Portuguese were the best sailors in the world. In fact, the Portuguese had begun their voyages of exploration to the east. Uh, this was all inspired by a Portuguese uh, prince named Henry the Navigator. And so Columbus studied with these guys, and he learned the craft of sailing. Uh, and then he had a huge idea, which is that the Portuguese were rounding the Cape of Good Hope. They were making their way to the Indies, largely India, to get spices from India, which were at that time not available in Europe. Uh, but Columbus thought they might be going the long way. Why don't I go the short way? Remember, the people at this time completely knew. In fact, the ancient Greeks knew that the earth was round. So all this nonsense, they all thought the earth was flat. No, they didn't. They knew it was round. Columbus thought, I can go the other way. Now, he greatly underestimated the distance. Uh, no one knew the circumference of the earth with any kind of exactitude. And in fact, Columbus calculated that the distance from the Canary Islands to Japan was about 2,400 nautical miles. In fact, it's 10 thousand nautical miles. Uh, Columbus didn't know that. Columbus actually thought that the earth was 60%, 65% land and 35% water. In fact, the earth is the opposite. It's two-thirds water, one-third land. So this is really why, why Columbus had his fundamental calculation wrong, but you can't blame him. They didn't have any instruments. They had no way of knowing how wide and how big that ocean actually was. And Columbus was a real entrepreneur because he basically decided, and he, oh, a huge idea that no one else had even really attempted. I'm going to go the other way. I'm going to find a new route to the Indies. He went to all these different governments in Europe, and finally he got a taker. He couldn't get money out of the um, the uh, uh, Holy Roman uh, Emperor. He couldn't get money out of Italy. He couldn't get money out of Portugal. Finally, he got money out of Spain. Uh, and he got money out of Spain by driving a hard bargain because he was an imperious man. And he basically said, look, I'll do this. But if I do it, you got to make me an admiral. you got to address me as admiral. I want a percentage of all the profits that come out of the spice trade. I want my children to be uh, inaugurated into the royalty. So Columbus was a guy who was, he was entrepreneurial in that he was out for himself. But he was also out to extend the influence of not just Western civilization. He thought of it more as Christianity into the new world. This was part of a larger argument between the Christians and the Muslims, a dispute over who was going to control the world. And Columbus goes, this is going to give the Christians a kind of decisive advantage, which in fact it did. It's almost unimaginable the conditions that Columbus encountered. I mean, these were miserably small ships. Everybody was cramped together. The food was horrible, a little salted meat, uh, bread and water, and even the water went bad. Um, no sleeping quarters. Columbus had a small bunk for himself. Everybody else sleeps in their normal clothes on the floor. Um, the, the voyage took 10 weeks. Huge swells, terrible seas, thunder and lightning, demands for him to turn back. You're never going to find land. Uh, some threats of a mutiny. The genius of Columbus that he is, is he had that indomitable will. And he also had a, he was a great sailor. He had the kind of instinct that, no, we're going to find it. We're going to find it. And 10 weeks later, they did. They found land and they made landfall. Now, uh, interestingly, um, 
the effect of all this was electric. I mean, this changed the world because after, after Columbus came more ships, and these were Spanish ships. Uh, Columbus himself, by the way, made four voyages to the Americas. He didn't just make a single trip. He made four trips. But with his second and third and fourth trip, he ran into trouble. Why did he run into trouble? Well, the answer is simple. He was Italian, and all the other people who came were Spanish. And so you had all these guys who became governor of this province and governor of that province, and they didn't want this upstart Italian telling them what to do. So they, they poisoned the Spanish aristocracy against uh, Columbus. Uh, ultimately, Columbus was even thrown in jail, poor guy. And when he was thrown in jail, very remarkably, uh, his critics, who would laugh at him when he first proposed his voyage, they were like, this is never going to work. This is ridiculous. It was really only the queen, uh, Isabella of Aragon. Um, I'm sorry, Isabella of Castile, uh, who encouraged Columbus and decided, I'm going to back you. You go do it. Uh, but all these courtiers, uh, and one of them, you know, a sailor himself, came to Columbus and in jail and was like, look at you now. And Columbus was like, yeah, look at me now. But uh, I think history will remember me differently because I did it and you didn't. And Columbus recognized the great historical uh, significance um, of what he had done. He made four transatlantic crossings, 1492, 1493, 1498, uh, and 1502. Um, the, um, he discovered the new world. Now, he didn't call it the new world. He called it the other world, um, Otro Mundo. But, and by new world, by the way, neither he nor Vespucci, who later got credit for kind of coining the term, they didn't mean that this was a new continent. What they meant was this is a part of the world that the ancients had no idea existed. So it was new in that sense. It was new in that uh, from the point of view of, of the West, there was no awareness that this part of the world even, even existed. And uh, again, uh, coming back to um, Columbus when he was in a bad way, he was not recognized. In fact, the Spanish sort of betrayed him. They didn't give him all the benefits that they had promised him. Uh, and he made a very kind of telling comment. He goes, listen, when I came to Spain to propose the voyage, Spain was a very poor country. Now Spain is rich. And who made it so? I did. He did. And this was just the plain truth of the matter. So here's a man, a great man, a great mariner, a great adventurer, and someone who changed all our lives, your life and my life, in ways I'm going to spell out. And when we look at the greatness of this man, the magnitude of his accomplishment, and the kind of pettiness of his critics, there's really no comparison. I'm ready now to take on some of the familiar leftist accusations against Columbus. This is really going to be fun. Uh, debunking these ideas. And I'm going to begin with this idea that Columbus didn't discover America. The preferred word among historians these days is that he encountered America. Now, this just seems a little semantic, but not, not for the activists. They, it's really important to them. Uh, why? Because their point is, how, how can you discover America, Dinesh? Because America was already here. How can you discover the native peoples, Dinesh? They were already here. So the idea here is that the concept of discovery is offensive. It's wrong. And what happened is that it's kind of like Columbus and the Indians were kind of, you know, they're like walking down a the street. They bumped into, oops, oh, oh, there you are. Oh, there you are. It's an encounter. It's not a discovery. I'm quoting now um, uh, the activist uh, Mike Anderson. He goes, the Europeans did not settle a virgin land. They invaded and displaced a native population. Um, uh, Homer uh, Ridges, uh, Europeans and native Indians, quote, mutually discovered each other. Now, <laughs> There's kind of a method to this madness. There's a point to this. that the, the left is trying to say that there was civilizational equality between Europe and the Native American population. So they're trying to assert something that is manifestly false. Um, and this can be proved in a very simple way. Is it a coincidence that it was Columbus, a European, an Italian with Spanish sponsorship, that landed here in the Americas? and not Native American boats that landed in Europe. Do you think that if the Native Americans could have made their way across the Atlantic and then, you know, sailed up the Thames or sailed up the Seine, they wouldn't have done it? Of course they would. But they couldn't do it. They didn't know how to do it. They couldn't even begin to do it. So the simple point of it is that Columbus was a sort of stand-in, a representative for the civilizational, certainly the technological, but the 
maritime superiority of Western civilization. He did something that could not have been done, you may say, in reverse. And then, of course, the left kind of sulkily conceding this point begins to say, well, yeah, but you know, Dinesh, uh, the guy was a racist. Here's Kirkpatrick Sale in his book, The Conquest of Paradise. And these are, these are white guys saying this nonsense. Anyway, he goes, Columbus, quote, presumed the inferiority of the natives. He was prejudiced. And he represented this Western tendency to, quote, fear what it does not comprehend and hate what it knows is fearful. This is the, really the standard line. And the question is, is it true? Was Columbus really prejudiced against the Indians? Well, it turns out that Columbus was prejudiced, but not against the Indians. He was prejudiced in their favor. His opinion, his original impression of these people was entirely positive. I'm actually going to just quote a few lines from Columbus's own journal so you can sort of see for yourself. He's describing the Guarani people that he first encounters on the first voyage. Quote, they are artless. Artless, he means without guile and so free with all they possess, and that no one would believe it without having seen it. Of anything they have, if you ask them for it, they will never say no. Rather, they invite the person to share it and show as much love as if they were giving their hearts. They are content with whatever thing or whatever kind may be given to them. They, be they believe very firmly that I, with these ships and people, came from the sky. And this does not result from their being ignorant, for they are, have a very keen intelligence, um, and so on and so on. So Columbus here has a very positive view uh, of the Indians. He says they, are, they don't have religion, but don't accuse them of idolatry. They, are, they will be very open to a Christian message if we offer it to them. He doesn't think there's no evidence Columbus was a racist or he thought these people were inferior. And by the way, he wasn't alone. Later people, uh, Pedro Alvarez Cabral, Amerigo Vespucci, Fernand Ferdinand Magellan, uh, Walter Raleigh, all of them registered similar impressions of the Indians. So the question then becomes, why did these Western attitudes toward the Indians, which were so positive, change? Uh, and my answer is really simple, because the white man discovered that there were other types of Indians, not as pleasant as the Guarani or later the Hopi, uh, or rather, there were brutally warlike tribes that had practices. And remember that the Westerners weren't angels either. These were greedy, uh, rapacious swordsmen that came from Spain. But even they were shocked. They were shocked by what? They were shocked by the, um, by the Incas in Peru. They were shocked by the Aztecs in Mexico. Why? These are people practicing widespread human sacrifice. They're slaughtering thousands of their own citizens. The Literally, the, the stairways leading up to the idols that were worshipped were drenched in blood. They stank of blood. And so the Spanish were like, oh my gosh. So the point here is we've got to realize today when we don't see any of this, where we have this kind of almost, you could call it the multicultural picnic view of the Native American. They're just dancing around in a circle. They're like sharing their harvest. You don't get the idea that, no, there were Carib Indians and they did eat human flesh. In fact, the very term cannibal comes from the term Carib. So the Spanish and the early uh, Western um, arrive, people who arrived in the Americas were astounded. They could hardly believe what was going on. Uh, and so the original positive impressions began to turn. Even, by the way, with the um, early American settlers, we look back, we see that people like Patrick Henry, John Marshall, Thomas Jefferson, these people very positively disposed to the Indians, respected their intelligence, in fact, proposed intermarriage with the Indian as a great way to sort of bring the two groups, the whites and the Indians, together into a new kind of society. So um, the point here is that A, um, Columbus did in fact discover America, and B, the kind of racism that he is accused of harboring, there is no evidence that in fact he did.